I want to start with the observation that a dog can never give birth to a non-dog. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. I mean, you may get a big dog or a little dog, I understand, but you're going to get a dog. It's good to know that creationism and evolution are perfectly in tune on this. If a dog didn't give birth to a dog, the whole theory of evolution would fall to the ground. And both sides agree, I hope, that the offspring are always slightly different to the parents. And most creationist preachers even agree that these small changes accumulate over time to produce different types of animals. And it could be the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. The only difference is that creationists believe, no matter how many changes there are, the animals are still the same kind, meaning that they can bring forth. See, if they can bring forth, they're the same kind. Simple definition, can they bring forth? Let's take the example of the greenish warbler. It doesn't give birth to a rat or an albatross. It gives birth to another greenish warbler, with, of course, slight genetic differences. Over successive generations, these differences accumulate. If some warblers move into new territory, their descendants are eventually going to look very different to the distant cousins they left behind. But they still interbreed, so, as the Bible would say, they're the same kind. And that's exactly what happened to the greenish warbler, which biologists think originated in the southern Himalayas. As the species expanded eastwards and northwards around the Tibetan plateau, it progressively changed. But despite the differences, each type of warbler could still interbreed with its neighbors. Creationists would call this a classic example of microevolution. Animals change, but they're still the same kind. They can still interbreed. The same thing happened with the warblers that spread around the west of the Tibetan plateau. As they adapted to their new environments, they changed, but each type of warbler could still interbreed with warblers from neighboring groups. Then the two lines came together to the north of the Tibetan plateau, and that's where the creationist theory comes unstuck. Because by now, each line has evolved so much, and become so different to the ancestral greenish warbler left behind in the Himalayas, that the neighboring species can't bring forth after their own kind. So according to the biblical definition, they must be different kinds. Let's just see what happens as we follow the evolutionary trail of these warblers northwards. Same kind, same kind, whoops! If they're all the same kind, why can't these two interbreed? That would make them a different kind. But we know this one can interbreed with this one, so they must be the same kind. Let's follow the trail back again. Same kind, same kind, same kind, dope! Oh! we've hit the same problem. These ones at the end can't be the same kind because they can't interbreed. This phenomenon is called ring species. This may not fit with the biblical idea of kinds, but the existence of ring species is perfectly compatible with evolution. In fact, we'd expect to get ring species according to the theory of evolution. This is because in the real world, evolution doesn't produce little boxes dividing organisms into kinds. Evolution is a gradation, a slow change from one type of organism into another. And when it hits on a type that's perfectly adapted to its environment, then that type stays much longer and changes much more slowly. And the result is that some animals that are closely related genetically breed very easily. As they drift apart, they don't breed so easily then with great difficulty, and finally not at all. This is called speciation, and we can see it in the fossil record as we go through layers of sedimentary rock. And because of ring species, we can see it happen as animals move and evolve geographically.